first of the bulk wine talks and i'm delighted to be doing this today um, with an old friend adam lechmere not very old but who i've known for a very long time um, he's now editor at large of club and logic magazine but i knew him first when he was news editor at decanter magazine and then um, also editor at large of, the, of that uh, publication and we're in the rest of this uh, series of events I am going to be the interviewer but for fun we're turning this on its head and today Adam is actually going to be the moderator and I'm going to be talking about um, the future of wine over the next 10 years so if I can just introduce Adam I think Adam is here if I say Adam Lechmere maybe he will appear there we go Adam Lechmere welcome and before we kick off, I'd like to say a few words about um, our, our hosts, if you like, from this event, which is uh, the, the World uh, Bulk Wine Exhibition, WBWE, which is, you know, this year we've had no Vin Expo, we've had no Provine, we've had no um, Vin Italy, um, and we've had no Bulk Wine Exhibition. And it's the well, Bulk Wine Exhibition is not uh, as familiar to quite a number of people as maybe some of those events but it's been one of my favorite events for a long time and it's I've actually been going I think probably for I don't know how many years eight years more um, and it doesn't have the the, the the showy stands that you have at Vin Italy and Vin Expo and, and the stands are generally quite small um, there's not much signage uh, the bottles very often are unlabeled because it's about wine fair but one of the things that people who don't know about bulk wine uh, discover when they go there is that bulk wine is not all uh low priced ordinary poor quality there's chablis there's chateauneuf du pape um there's chianti there's all sorts of wines with very significant appellations but there's also some really delicious shirazes from australia um sauvignons from new zealand <clears throat> wide range of wines and it's very much down to business and what's also fascinating is on the stands that you go to there are ranges of wines and you might have on one stand they might have five different Pinot Grigios from the same producer they might be a cooperative or they might be a family winery there's one in from Italy that I know very well and you get the chance to make your own blend on the stand and if you're a supermarket or you're a retailer or whoever you are anywhere, you can say, well, actually, can you send me some samples, which are 60% of number one, 20% of number two, and so on. And we'll, that will come back to our tasting room at, at the retailer and we'll decide whether that's what we want or don't want. And it's a, it's the fascinating thing about it as a fair is that it's everybody there is there for the same reason. There's no, um, there aren't very many press, to be honest. Um, everybody is there who is interested in buying and you get a lot of very frank answers people will tell you that it's been a, a rough vintage or a good vintage they'll tell you that the prices are going up or down or there's there's not much of this but there's plenty of that and then there's this fascinating area which I love which you saw briefly in the video at the beginning which is called the silent tasting area which is just one big end of the hall this is in, the, in this Amsterdam exhibition center with 400 samples of wine and they're just wine by wine by wine. And you can taste 30 or 40 or 50 Chardonnays from different countries or whatever. And then the, all these wines are obviously on show at the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the fair. And then you go and meet the people. But there's no discussion. You define, define which ones you like. And you'll find that some have got some oak and some haven't. And some are uh, lean and mineral. And some are, and there's some, some of the wines are delicious. And they're interesting. And they're, they're not great necessarily you're not talking about fine wine but you're talking about delicious wines and the point about this is that these are wines that may well be selling for three or four euros some of them a liter well if you start to think about what it is in a bottle by the time it's been shipped and so on these may well end up in a premium wine um, either under a retailer's own um, label or indeed under um, some big companies may well be buying wine to make up their own blends so it's a, an event that i'm really sorry isn't um, I'm not going to be at this year because I always enjoy going there, especially because it is in Amsterdam. It's a great place to go. And then briefly, a quick word, what the World Bulk Wine Expression has done this year is because there isn't an event, they've set up this Connect service, which you can find if you actually just go to their, their website. And you, if you're a buyer, um, I, can't, I can't remember how much the price is, but you, you can sign up and then they will put you in contact with exhibitors who've got the kind of wine you're looking for. So if you want Pinot Noir or you want Pinot Gris, um, and you, you, here's the volume and sort of price you're looking at, they will be talking to their exhibitors and saying, here are the kind of wines that you might 
be that you might have found wandering around the fair yourself. So that's really the background to the event. And the reason what we're doing today um, with Adam, and I hope we're going to get some, some questions from you in the audience, please have as many questions as you can. I'd like to talk a little bit about what I see happening to wine over the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years, because I think we've seen some huge changes over the last 20 years that we haven't necessarily even noticed. And I, I, we can extrapolate from there. We tend to think about wine as not changing very much. Um, but there are so many things that um, really we now uh, have sort of seen coming along. And you know, so I'm going to go through what I call the 12 shades of wine. And um, as I go through, Adam, please do throw some questions and anybody else throw some questions at me. So they're not necessarily an absolute order. You'll, you'll understand the order as we go through them. But fine wine has changed. When I started writing about wine in the 1980s, a long time ago, fine wine was Bordeaux, Burgundy, Port, and not very much else. Um, you know, Priorat wasn't on the list. The idea of... of um, Brunello de Montalcino was, was barely on the list then. Chianti certainly wasn't. And El California, there was no way that California was in, in there as fine wine. Well, the way things are going, we're going to see fine wine. Wine was acknowledged as fine from all sorts of places, which will include Chile and Uruguay and Argentina, South Africa, but also corners of Europe that we do not necessarily think. And I think that's an interesting change. And the definition of fine wine, um, Adam and I have both been involved in something called uh, fine minds for fine wines, um, which is a, uh, by the Iranian Institute, where they try to identify what is fine wine and what's going to happen to it. There's a lot of discussion. It doesn't necessarily overlap with the bulk wine fair, but you'll see as we go through um, how I think there will be some areas where they do overlap. And one of the things that's fascinating is, and that gives me the chance to bring it in, is climate change. Because if you look at what's happening to the climate, um, at the moment, Bordeaux is now allowing people to grow Tariga Nacional and Marcelin in Bordeaux. Now, those are not going to be allowed at the moment in Pauillac and um, Margot and the top Appalachians. It will just be in Bordeaux Rouge and Bordeaux Superior. But that's now. I've got friends in, in Pesat Leonio who are thinking, should we replant Merlot today with what the climate's doing? Don't know. So, and what is the alcohol level of your wine going to be? We've got Burgundies this year at 14 15%. Is that the definition of what we would have called fine wine 20 years ago? So I think our definition of fine wine is changing quite a lot. And that also moves us into ageability. Um, historically, you know, the comp whole concept of fine wine was it had to age. How much wine is being drunk Older. Are we going to see maybe a renaissance of older wine? Are people going to start holding on to more in museum uh, releases um, as a way of actually rebuilding an interest in old wine? Because that's definitely fallen off um, the, the menu. Move on to familiar appellations. And, you know, there are, I always think of appellations like grape varieties, a bit like the Hagen das ice cream cabinet, where you've always, wherever you are, whether you're in Hamburg or Hanoi, you'll have chocolate and you'll have strawberry and you'll have vanilla. Um, but actually you have some flavors that are unique to some countries so that in China you'll get, um, they have pea ice cream or pea sorbet, which we can't imagine. It's, it's actually delicious. And you get green tea sorbet in, in Japan. Um, but you get things from nowhere. You get flavors. So salted caramel weren't, wasn't there 15 years ago, 20 years ago. It's something we now get used to. Uh, mint and chocolate wasn't there. And by the same token in wine, we didn't have Pinot Grigio. We didn't have Malbec on our shelves in the way that we have today. And that's the question is, what are going to be the appellations? Picpoul de Pinay, for example, has come from nowhere in recent times. So what are going to be the appellations that come into the mainstream? Prosecco, we take it for granted that Prosecco is now ubiquitous, but it wasn't. It's come from nowhere. What is going to be the next one of those? Same applies, as I just said, to varietals. We've also got what I call brand first. And I think this is a, this is a fascinating area where um, consumers, and this is the area that a lot of wine traditionalists absolutely hate, which is the fact that people going out and they're buying a bottle of I Heart. And it's got the heart on it, and it's I heart Pinot Grigio, 
and where's that from? It could come from Italy, it could come from Hungary, it could come from Romania. Um, I don't mind because all I know is it tastes like Pinot Grigio. And it could say, I heart Chianti, well, that, that would at least come from Chianti, but we won't know which producer it's at. And then we'll look at something like Barefoot or Cupcake. And you know, how does a wine get to be called Cupcake in the first place or 19 Crimes? And what I'm doing is I'm trusting the brand more than I'm even bothered about a grape variety or a region. So you have, for example, cupcake red, red velvet or apothic inferno or whatever. So you're, you're trusting the brand and Penfolds has been a great example of this where you have Penfolds bin numbers, but Penfolds has now gone from being a quintessentially um, Australian brand to making wine in California. Now, this hasn't always worked. Lindemann's got it wrong and tried to be a brand for everywhere. And um, uh, we saw that with Matthias Rosé, tried to, to make Matthias in, in um, Australia and other places, and that wasn't a success. So it's, it, handling it isn't necessarily uh, straightforward, but um, I think that this is something that we are going to see more of because of China. And China is huge, and that brings me on to my second big, big change, which is the way we distribute wine today. We are buying online. We're buying, um, we're not necessarily standing in a shop looking at the wall of wine that we were in the past. And that means that today, people are only beginning to realize that I can say, Alexa, get me some Merlot. I can say, OK, Google to my Google Assistant, get me some wine. And Google, my, my Google Assistant will say, do you want the one you had last time? Do you want um, one like the one you had last time? And they know what I like. That changes the pattern. And so basically, I think maybe today, the new generation of, of drinkers may well trust Penfolds enough to buy the Penfolds premium Californian wine in a way that maybe we weren't as ready to buy the Lindemann's wine. And that's certainly happening to the brands like Barefoot and Cupcake. Then we go into the more esoteric areas. Um, and so, so those sort of wines, obviously the bulk area is very relevant to the things I've talked about in all of those in the sense that you can get your Chianti in bulk. If you're doing your Pinot Grigio for a brand, um, that is obviously a supermarket private label Pinot Grigio is very much going to be a bulk purchase potentially, but the same is going to apply to the brands like iHeart and, and Barefoot. Then we get into our unfamiliar regions and varietals. So you think about something, that I'm just looking at a, a label in front of me, which is uh, Vranets from North Macedonia. Um, or we could talk Kadaka or Saparavi or Rakatsateli. Those happen to be Eastern Europeans, but it could be Tanat from, um, from Uruguay. These are things that there is a, I think there's a definite market out there for people who want something different. They don't want Cabernet or Merlot or Pinot Noir or whatever. Um, they want something that, that actually sets them apart um, in food and in potentially in music. The sort of music listening to may not be um, what you would have called the old top 20 um, music. And I can see there's definitely a move there. And there's those, uh, the regions behind them are going to be using the new technology of digital distrib distribution. So what they can do is say, right, um, Adam, you're the sort of person who actually goes on holiday to interesting places off the beaten track. And Adam, I noticed that you're buying some quite unusual food. So actually you might be, and we know various other things about you, we might target some information about Vranets to you. And we might target it to you in the form of uh, advertisements on Instagram. And they might just be wonderful pictures of people with bottles of Vranets, or they might be stories about Vranets, but that might work because you, they've targeted you as being somebody on whom that will actually um, land. Whereas the, your next door neighbor might be seeing um, information about I Heart Pinot Grigio or something else. And that I think is something we're gonna see far more of where wine is either going to be produced for particular people. Um, and that brings me into 19 Crimes, which has been one of the most successful wine launches in, in the history of wine. And the interesting thing about 19 Crimes, and if you don't know it, it's an Australian wine put out by Treasury with augmented reality labels with criminals. I mean, they didn't necessarily do very much, but they were sent to Australia from um, Britain um, back in the, the, the 19th century. 
and um, they're talking about why they were sent to Australia. They don't have Australian accents. They don't talk about wine. There is nothing to do with wine about this. What we just have are these faces of these people who've committed some kind of crime. And the whole brand was invented for young men who were drinking beer, were drinking spirits, and didn't feel part of the wine world, where we had wines like Cupcake and Little White Dress, Little Black Dress, sorry, um, and a number of wines that were very, and indeed Barefoot, which were very, quote unquote, female friendly. I know this is very politically uh, dubious as a, an area, but it's no question that more women were buying Cupcake than men. And they said, what can we make for when? For when? 19 Crimes came along, and it's been a huge success. And then fascinatingly, of course, what's then followed is that lots of women have been buying 19 crimes as well. So it's, it's taken off. So you've got wines made for people. And then we've got, on the other hand, we've got wines uh, like these traditional European grape varieties and regions, which um, they're not made. They're made very much the way potentially tradition wants them to. But people are saying, well, who, who will buy these? Who will, who will appreciate them? We've got organic, which is growing. It's not grown as quickly as a lot of people have thought. People still think of wine as being organic without even sort of wondering about it. Um, and biodynamic. And I think that we often see it in Europe, I see, because the word bio means organic in, in a lot of European languages, there's a lot of confusion between biodynamic, biodynamics, and organic. Very, very few people know what biodynamic is. And they are wine buffs. Anybody outside that world doesn't, but it has a strong following amongst a tiny number of people. Organic, as I said, is growing because people kind of know they buy organic milk and organic eggs, so that, that works. But then we move across to natural, and very few people know about it, but the people who do know about it, and I talk about sort of Soho and Brooklyn, um, and there's parts of Tokyo, and Copenhagen, very big on this, is wine made with no sulfur, uh made with um no human intervention now you think well how do organic natural wines fit into the into the bulk wine picture well they do absolutely because you can buy um you can buy a container you can buy a flexi tank of organic chardonnay we're not seeing uh, bulk natural wine yet, and I think that's going to be harder to see. But I'm not sure that it isn't possible in the in the long term. It's going to be very interesting to see how that works, especially with the low sulfur um, regime. We've got next. We've got our rule breakers, and um, Penfolds comes back to mind here because of its blend of uh, uh, Australian Shiraz and Baijiu Chinese brandy, which was done for the Chinese market, um, phenomenally successful in China. But in the States, we've got a large number of brands of wines aged in um, spirits barrels, usually bourbon, but we've got some with rum, some with uh, tequila. Talking 12 million bottles, huge number of bottles of wine um, there. And people, the wine traditionalists hate the idea of a wine that tastes of bourbon. What they're, the point they're missing is the people who like bourbon like wines that taste of bourbon and there's a lot of people who like bourbon so that kind of transgressive um, area is going to grow alongside the fruit flavored wines and again that's where a lot of south african bulk wine has gone into france to be flavored with apricot and um, orange and strawberries and so on low and no alcohol hugely growing market um, and obviously opposite to natural wine because you can't do it in a non-interventionist way but again if you what you're going to do is you're going to put wine through a spinning cone um, taking away the alcohol and i think that's going to be something we're going to see more and more of clean wine is a recent story um, and what is clean wine it's a it comes out of the clean food movement again it's kind of overlaps with organic and natural and so on but the idea is there's no gluten there's no salt there's no this and that there's an awful lot of, of marketing bullshit there but it's got a hold and an awful lot of people it gives a lot of people permission to drink wine people who, who think well wine you know it's unhealthy it's this and that I, well, that makes me feel all right and in america the whole clean thing has, has moved quite well and it's gone quite unnoticed until now but it is growing and uh, one of the reasons for that is that we've got some um, celebrities involved in it. And that moves into the next area, which is celebrity wine. Again, we've, we've had that for a long time. Lily Langtree, 
the actress in the um, 1800s, early 1900s, was, was, was a celebrity in California. But we've got a huge, huge, huge number of celebrities almost every week. There's Post Malone's done it, um, you know, there's, so we know about Brangelina, but there's every day, um, Cara Delevingne, there's, there's so many um, celebrities out there of one kind or another. And there's a company that is just doing celebrity wine in America. And then finally, that brings me to my last category, racing through these, which is luxury wine. And it's a category that a lot of people, um, Janice Robinson particularly, hates that. But I'm going to start by saying that all wine is a luxury. Unless you're an alcoholic, it, nobody needs it. Um, but what we've seen in recent times is the idea of a category that is separate to the familiar appellations and separate to fine wine. But it is wine, if you like, as a box of chocolates. It is wine that actually you pay a premium for. You feel very good about buying it. You feel good. It makes you feel good to have it, or at least you feel good to give it to somebody else. And in the States, there's a whole range of them. They started with one of the most famous is The Prisoner. But Orin Swift is a range of those wines. And these are wines that are about, um, about $50 to $100 a bottle. Um, and they don't have a region. They don't have a great variety necessarily. You're buying for where they look. So I've gone nonstop there for 15, I think 15 minutes. I'm going to take breath. Adam, for you to please well start. Done. Yes. Any questions thank you've got coming in? Thank you very much, Robert. Um, there's no, no questions yet. Um, but one of, the, one of the sort of things that I thought was particularly interesting, I'm talking about the 19 Crimes um, wine, um, you know, the way that that wine was created um, for young men. Um, and we talked a lot about the label and how, how important the label was. Um, and we didn't talk about the style of the wine in the bottle. Now, I'm, I'm thinking actually that the, 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 the presentation of the wine is the most important thing. And... Um, you know, we didn't talk much, you haven't talked at all, really, about packaging and how important packaging is um, in in um, in the presentation and the selling of wine. And that's something that is um, evolving very, very fast, isn't it? You know, we, we, you and I were talking about it the other day, about how, um, you know, in, in, in the US, they're far, far, far more advanced in their sort of, um, in, in, in their sort of packaging than the UK are. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and which countries have yes, the best? I think, that, of, I think that's a fascinating area. And, and finally, enough, I did a book on called The Art of the Wine Label in 1989. And it's, it's extraordinary how things have changed since then. So what I haven't been giving, you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to move on to this, because what we are seeing, of course, is cans. And cans are a fascinating thing in, in wine. I mean, the Coppola wine, Sophia, um, uh, started, that, that's 2002, I think. It's been around for a while. But the interesting thing about cans is they take wine out of the traditional, it's got to come out of whether a corkscrew or a screw cap. Suddenly it becomes a convenient beverage. And one of the reasons cans have taken off even faster in the US in the last year has been the explosion of hard seltzer. And hard seltzer is something, that, again, outside America, a lot of people are not aware of, but it's huge. It's bigger than vodka at the moment, and it's going to overtake, um, it'll overtake gin very quickly. It is a very big sector. And what it is, is water, alcohol, fizzy water, alcohol, and flavorings. And it's refreshing, and it's about 5% alcohol. Well, we've got bottles of, of actually Pinot Noir, which are about 12.5%, or not bottles, cans taking off and a lot of rosé and a lot of light sparkling white. So cans, bag in box is growing um, and we'll see, and keg is growing. But also we'll come back to your point about packaging of labels, which is I think we started this. Um, I think that now we're understanding that people aren't necessarily looking for um, the words on the label. They're looking for the image. And it's what Matthias Rosé understood, the, the, what, um, the, the, the creator Gedge of, of, of um, uh, that Salvador Gedge who created um, Matthias Rosé in the 1940s understood, if you saw that bottle and that shape and you knew it, you'd buy it again. And Barefoot, you see the Barefoot logo on it. And if you look at my the luxury wines I was referring to earlier, Orin Swift, and those wines are designed by the winemaker, as it happens, who's a, obviously a, a genius in both areas. Um, once you've seen one label, you understand the rest. But to go back to your style of the wine, I, I think it is important, obviously. The wine has to taste right. And there's an awful lot of work that goes into that. So for example, California, um, again, the, 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 the natural wine people would love to believe that everybody wants to drink light, fresh, 
uh, 12%, no oak, no sweetness, and so on. And that's what they want, and that's fine. In the States, there is a big, very big market for 15% rich, oaky um, with wine with lots of intensity and lots of alcohol. And so if you're making a wine, you need to get that right. And it's not that easy. So, for mm. example, because um, I make wine in France, we can't find that kind of fruit in France very easily to compete with those kinds of wine from California. If I wanted to compete with some of those wines, I'd have to go to Spain, southern Italy or Portugal, probably, to get the intensity of mm. fruit. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to buy some cheap wine and put some sugar in and put mm. some red concentrate and, and work. No, you need actually the quality of the wine needs to be good. And that's also true for yellowtail. Yellowtail's got about 12 grams of sugar. You can't make yellowtail with, 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 with ordinary, ordinary juice. And what I found, um, you know, I'm doing, doing a piece on packaging at the moment and talking to um, canned wine, pack, people making um, wine in cans, um, like the canned wine company that, that, that I think you recommended to me, is what, what is so fascinating is how, um, how much care they're taking in what goes into the can. Because a can, you know, I, I'd always assume that a can would just be just another, no, another way of presenting wine, another way of packaging. But it's not because wine tastes very different when you drink it from a can. So you have to be very, very careful about, you know, the, 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 the aroma of the wine and, and, and how the wine is going to appear. Then you have to think about whether the wine is going to be poured out from the can into a glass or whether it's going to be drunk straight from the can. And these are all, it all gets very complicated. And at the same time, um, also, I, I note, um, and this is something that people who have been putting wine into cans know very well, is, is that it's a great way of premiumizing your wine as well. Um, and mm. St. Michel has found this, um, that, that you know, people are putting very expensive wine into cans. And do you think this is something that's going to grow? I think there's a fear at the moment, the price does seem to be flattening in America. And there's an aluminium shortage, which is interesting. Um, so that you, actually new cans may be a, a bit of a problem. But cans are environmentally friendly in so many ways. And I think also there's some wine making um, and, and packaging constraints, the amount of sulfur you use and so on. But we went through that with, with screw caps. But that leads me to another thing which I've been looking at, which is that, and this is relevant again to events like, like, like Bulk Fair, if you like, the world over the last, we, we, a lot of banging on about how we don't like heavy bottles. Um, but funnily enough, we have all accept that the number of sample bottles of wine that are flying around the world, um, glass, and all I need to taste is, is, is a tiny amount. And then what do I do with the other 68 centiliters of wine of the 10, in each of the 10 bottles I've just been sent? Well, with the COVID-19 situation, 67 Pall Mall with the first that I know of, uh, there have been some things with test tubes done in the States, to be fair, but as a, as a concept, they said, right, let's do these online tastings that we will send out small samples. And the people at C7 Palmau, who were not winemakers and with no, no historic expertise in it, set up a complete bottling line with argon gas. They experimented, they got these little bottles, I mean, they bought the entire stock of little bottles, and they managed to make it work. And we're beginning to see quite a lot of that. So I had something from Tasmania the other day where I had, I don't know if you had these as well, but six um, tiny little samples, enough for me to taste, quite enough. In fact, I had enough for somebody else to taste. But if I weighed the little bottles I got from Tasmania, all six of them in the cardboard box weighed less than one bottle of wine with no packaging, one standard bottle of 70 mm. weight Now, most wineries are not set up to bottle tiny little bottles and I don't know, samples with, with the gas and so on. So what's going to happen there? Um, are we going to see, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting we're going to see service companies setting up where I will send them the bottles and they will dispatch the, the little samples for me. Or will there be equipment coming along that I can actually just buy a small kit that I can put in my winery? Because I was already now, you mentioned packaging, I can now get small labeler machines where I can do a, a short label run of 100 labels and a little bit of kit that costs two or $3,000. Maybe for two or $3,000, I can get a bit of kit that will enable me to, to actually produce little samples reliably. The moment I do that, suddenly I, as a retailer or a distributor, can start talking to my customers in a different way. Instead of saying, come to my tasting, or instead of saying, please buy this, these, this six pack of 75 centiliter bottles, I can send you 12 little samples to taste. You'll pay me for them. 
you tell me which ones you like, and hey, presto, you're, you're going to then buy the wines you know you like. I think that's a very likely way for us to go. Um, moving back, um, we were talking um, earlier about um, about um, what, what I call brand extensions. Um, you were talking about Penfolds and the way Penfolds, are, you know, they're making a champagne, they're way, making a wine in Napa, um, obviously, you know, using their, their extraordinary heft through Treasury Wine Estates. They've got, they've got um, Beaulieu, Beaulieu Vineyards, they've got all sorts of land in Napa they can call on. But what fascinated me about the Penfolds um, operation was when they when they press released it when they sent when they announced their decision to start making a wine in napa they didn't sort of pay any lip service to you know this is going to be a, a wine that's absolutely true to its terroir etc i mean they obviously said that but they also said very very openly this is a fabulous brand extension for us they used the word brand they used they used all these trigger words that fine wine people absolutely loathe um they probably even use the word luxury. They seem to be totally brazen about this idea that they were kind of extending the kind of penfold sort of hegemony around the world. And I thought that was really interesting that, um, that, that they, were, they were able to do that. Um, and that, that's, that's really simply because they have such a, they have such power, don't they? You know, and, and, and you know, other, other smaller companies don't have that power, which is perhaps why Lindemann's failed to, 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 to extend their brand so comprehensively as Penfolds have done. I, I, I think it's a good point, but I also think it's the strength. I mean, it may not be size. It may be the strength of a brand. I think that there may be some quite small, quote unquote, brands um, that could do more. So I remember when I was uh, quite young, somebody said to me, you know, basically, um, why don't this is when you know, this is a long time ago? Why don't Rolls Royce make watches? Rolls Royce make great cars. Uh, why wouldn't why wouldn't they do that? And I at the time thought, what a stupid idea. Well, Porsche, of course, got into all sorts of things. You can get a Porsche drill. You can get, you know, there is yeah. the luxury products understand brand extension. So I don't know why we couldn't have an Ecam perfume. I don't know why there there couldn't be a Latour hotel. I don't know why, you know, potentially there could be you know, all sorts of things. Um, there's no logic here. There, there's a logic to what is coherent within a brand. And I did some work a long time ago for Richemont, where we looked at what you could do with Dunhill versus what you could do with Cartier and what you could do with Mont Blanc. And you can't necessarily do all the same things with those three luxury brands because each of them has its own identity and its own customers. And that brings me back to what I was saying earlier. Um, it's understanding who the wines are for. Um, are we making them for uh, uh, ourselves as wine producers or are we making them for customers? If we know the kinds of customers we're making them for and we know those customers will accept the, the Penfolds brand or the Krug brand, why not give them what they want? And, and indeed, mm -hmm. that gives us cupcake um, vodka, for example. I think what you've been talking about, really, I, I jotted down when we were talking about clean wines, you were talking about clean wines and you were saying that, um, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about clean wines um, and, and everybody knows what we're talking about, what, what we mean by clean wines, you know, this idea that the wine is is somehow cleaner than natural wine. It's got no sulfites, etc. And it's 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 a really fascinating new development. But you said what clean wines do is they give you permission. They give you permission to drink wine. So you might be dieting manically. You might be a full on vegan. You might be exercising, taking it, but you can still drink wine because it's clean. And what they're doing there as a brand is they're appealing to the heart and not the head. And um, that strikes me as an essential difference between um, the sort of wine, the sort of higher echelons of wine and the and, and, and the and the sort of, um, if you like, cheaper wine. So 19 crimes, for example appeals directly to the heart, doesn't it? Um, but I think all wine, ultimately, you know, I think essentially we as wine people, you and I have both been in the sort of the fine wine end over the years, we think of wine as being um, sort of cerebral and people thinking about it. I think that most of it, ultimately, when you look at why do you buy a car, why do you buy perfume, why do you buy a watch, um, even if it's got a score, you know, essentially the score is just actually supporting your desire to spend that much on that wine. Um, I think that most wine buying is actually irrational. And that's why the label is so important. That's why the stories are important. That's why everything about it 
has got to make me spend five, 10, 20, 100, whatever it is, dollars on something that I really don't need. And, you know, and what will work on me won't necessarily work on my next door neighbor, and it won't necessarily work on me tomorrow. And I think that what, um, what is fascinating today is the sophistication of brand owners in every field in saying, right, what, actually, we never think about wine as solving a problem. But actually, when anybody's buying a bottle of wine, they do have a kind of problem to solve. Now, the problem may be as mundane as a liquid to wash a stew down with, or it may be to show off to someone, or it may be to say sorry, it may be to make yourself feel. And that is what, that the moment you start thinking about that, I think you you change your view. And you mm-hmm. then, even, even if you're saying, I'm not going to change the, I want to make the wine my father made. I don't want to bend to the wind. And you shouldn't, you mm-hmm. don't need to bend to the wind. But if you're an artist and you happen to paint this or that kind of picture, the gallery that takes on your paintings will take on your paintings knowing the kind of person they're going to sell them to. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think in the wine industry, we've been very good at that. Yeah. Everything, everything has to market. Yes. I think we're nearly, have yeah. you got any more questions? Any questions coming? I think we're nearly through. I don't know if I have. Got any questions. We've got a question. Um, we've just got a question from here. Um, but one, from um, talking about the future of fine wine, rather the future of wine, where do you see the future of wine? Is, there, is it going to be more daily consumption of cheap wine or more consumption of wine occasionally of more expensive? Are we, the oh, question basically is, are we going towards quantity or quality? I think it's a very good question. It's a fundamental question. And I think everything, everything says that we, that the, and that's that coming in from Spanish. It, that's coming from the, Spanish. The in Spain, unfortunately, it's very relevant to Spain. Um, the, 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 it's, I, it breaks my heart when I see the price of wine in Spain. When I see how much you have to pay for a bottle of, of water, at the airport and I see how much some really drinkable Spanish wine is being sold um, in bulk, but not just Spain, but it's true in Eastern Europe and so on. It, it isn't sustainable. It isn't sustainable in terms of water. It isn't sustainable in terms of environmental costs and so on. So I think that wine, you know, complain about wine being too expensive, complain about wine being too cheap. We've also got health elements. If we start to look at the health story, Um, ultimately we can't go on drinking the idea of drinking two or three glasses a day and that's 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 okay it isn't if you talk to doctors you look at the cancer risk you look at everything else actually it's a very small amount per day that you can really drink and feel safe so i think a lot of people and i'll take very very honestly about this in 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 our household we will drink probably two-thirds of a bottle that's what 50 centiliters um, when we open it, we don't necessarily finish a 75 centiliter bottle and we don't drink wine necessarily every day. And I love wine. My partner loves wine, but we don't have to have it. And I think that's definitely the way in which we're going. The idea of thinking, oh, I have to have two bottles a night of, and it don't matter what it tastes like. Those days are the past. And we have to find the way. Yeah. And I think that's the challenge to, to the person asking your question. The challenge is how do we get, we've, we've groomed people in a Spanish supermarket to go in and buy wine for two euros, Portuguese supermarket, whatever. Um, and we told them you can drink, you can buy very drinkable wine for two euros 50 for a 75 centiliter bottle. How do we take those people and say, actually, now it's going to have to cost you more. And I think environmental taxes may come into play there. We might start taxing bottles. We may do various, but I really don't believe in 10 years time, I do not believe we will be drinking as much. And I think mm-hmm. the young people who are moving into wine aren't going to drink it in the same way that we do in the same way. Um, the, 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 the course, the, the, the great success of Spanish wine has been its reliability, hasn't it? And that's, that's yeah. its, its, its great success and the millstone round its neck it, it 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 is so incredibly reliable and you know that you can get a bottle of campo viejo uh yeah. the, the the basic priantha campo viejo um tempranillo um and you know it's going to be a good bottle of wine and that you can't really say there are very few regions you can say that for which which is um which is which is tragic in its way isn't it um as well, you say you feel that, like... to its credit uh, campo viejo and to, to pano rico's credit campo viejo the, the value of Campo Viejo as a brand is better actually than the value of Rioja. The price of Campo Viejo has gone up more 
mm. than mm. the price of bulk Rioja. And that's mm. where, mm. and Priorat is the, is the opposite in a way where, one well, of the opposite, where Priorat as a region has has had a, a, an incremental, mm. the, the price has gone up. Albarino from Rias Baixas. Rias Baixas has at least a, a, some kind of, of price premium on it, but not many, mm. Piazzo does, for example. Um, but mm. we need more, and I think that possibly, and I think this is maybe when we're going to do more questions, but I think we're probably near the end, but the interesting question is the appellation system is, is controversial, we said. People talk about um, they don't like wine being a commodity. The moment you have an appellation, you are a commodity. Somebody is going to want to buy. The moment you say there is something called Chablis or saint Emilion or Chianti or, or Rioja, people are going to want to buy the cheapest Rioja they can find and somebody will have the cheapest Rioja. And the question is how good, how acceptable is the cheapest and do you buy the second cheapest or third cheapest? Mm. But the moment Campo Viejo says, right, you can buy a cheaper Rioja than Campo Viejo, um, but it's not Campo Viejo. Uh, how long How long have we got, Robert? So I'm, I'm, um... I think we're nearly through. Unless there are any questions, I think we're probably Sorry, about no. time, but unless you've got, you've got any more questions. Are we, are we going on to 45 or... or we, yeah, we, I think we, so. We, I think we, 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 so, about there. so um, okay. any more questions out there? Now's your chance. Yeah, if, if anybody wants to um, pitch in with something, we've got a couple of minutes more. Um, if not... Um, you know, I, I watch this it's on YouTube. Like, oh, sorry. There's, there's no more questions coming in. Personally, I found that absolutely fascinating, Robert. I think one of, one of the, the most interesting things is that most of us um, consider that, that wine is essentially a very, very conservative business. Um, if you were to ask anybody in the wine business, uh, they, they'd, they'd say the same. You know, wine takes ages to change. I mean, we haven't we've managed to introduce screw caps in the last sort of several hundred years, but that's about it. We're still putting wine in glass bottles with bits of bark stuck in them. But actually, from, from the way from the way you discuss wine, it's it, it really sounds like a, a radical business. You know, um, just the idea of putting natural wine into into flexi tanks, for example. Um, well, orange wine, for example, we didn't. I mean, I haven't barely mentioned it, but just just to wrap up. Orange wine didn't exist really in 20 years ago. No one was talking mm. about it. Mm. Today we all are. And it's a bit like, you know, now we've all got mm. phones that are cameras and phones that are computers. Until somebody turned a phone into a camera or a music device, we didn't imagine it. And mm. wine has been like that. So, I, you know, people now drinking their bourbon barrel wine every day, very happily. And the yeah. rest of the world doesn't know about it, doesn't care about it or whatever. Those people are happy. Mm. And other people are drinking their orange wine every day and enjoying it. And those two coexist. And the, the people who drink both of those may never actually overlap. But I suppose I'm going to finish so by not... saying there's no recipe. There's no one, there's no one way. It's, it's just a, a last question. The last one that's just come in. Um, that that's um we'll, we'll just put to you do you think there is a field of sale in bulk for the white wine of the year 2019 now um do you understand that question robert if not yes. um I'll, i I'll guess well, not, well i guess what i'm trying to imagine this is probably translated from what some is english may not be the first language but i think we have an interesting question which we haven't talked about because i've been talking very much about the future but obviously if we talk about the current moment we do have a problem which is that we haven't to, to, to grapes or vines have babies every year and we've just got the 2020 into tanks now did we have a chance to sell our 2019 no of course we didn't we didn't have the, the fairs we didn't have everything else so yes in europe we've had various schemes to deal with distillation and so on but there is we have a huge problem now of actually distribution and i think that's a relevant point in terms of the on trade the off trade, unless we've got an on trade, a lot of wine that used to go through there isn't going through there. And 2019 white wine, by definition, certainly in the bulk market, that should have gone by now. We should be, you know, in a sense, we should be in November 20, we should be looking towards taking the 19s, remaining 19s should be going off the shelves, and the 20s should be coming on the shelves in the next what, four months. Um, is that going to happen? And I think that's a, there is, I think, a, a huge question over um, uh, wine at the bottom end of the, the scale, particularly from 2019 and indeed this in 2018, 
wine still hanging mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the, the, the situation today for a lot of wineries is not easy. Having said that, um, there are markets that are opening out and there are, um, so the states, um, we've had the, the tariffs, we haven't talked about that, um, which have been horrendous for parts of Europe. And they're probably not going to go away, even with Biden in power, the 25% tariff is still going to be there. The 100% tariff that, that Trump threatened may not be as much of a threat, but we are going to have to be better at selling wine than we've been. So I'm sorry, to whoever wants to know, is there going to be a market for 2019 white wine and so on? Very hard, I'd say. Mm. And there's going to be an awful lot of distillation, I should think, as well, isn't there? More there distillation. Is, and, um, mm. But I think that, that the, the, I've been looking at this as well, and I think one of the problems is that we tend to look at it in a very feudal way in Europe. So we always say, oh, will the region or the government of my country or Europe help me by distilling my my wine because I've made too much or the market hasn't done. I think in the real world, unfortunately, the wine industry is going to have to get a lot better and is going to have to understand that if it makes wine that people don't want to buy, it may not be able to survive. So we're all going to have to be better at actually creating mm -hmm. markets for our wines. Um, thank you. Robert, thank you very much indeed. Um, you, I think. I think it's it's also very ironic that actually, the, you know, that the, the, this is the one year, 2020 is the one year when there should have been an absolutely, um, absolutely uh, vital, um, you know, uh, conference on bulk wine. That This is where you needed to have a world yes. bulk wine um, exhibition. And this is the one time we haven't managed to have it. So I, I hope next year it comes back. And I should certainly like to go myself next year. Sounds fascinating. I'm sure you'll be invited. Um, so thank, thank you, you very much, Robert. I don't know if you want to finish up with, thank with anything. You. Thank or, you, Christina. Um... And I'm going to be doing more this week. You look at the program. You can see we're talking about bulk wine in uh, America with Greg Livingood. We're talking about uh, bulk wine um, in South Africa um, uh, with Bernard Fontenez from Origin Wines and um, in China with Marcus Ford. So in each case, we're trying to look at the way uh, and a number of other people we're looking at every element we can of the wine business with bulk in particular so thank you all for attending and if you haven't caught all of it come by and see it on uh, youtube and otherwise follow back tomorrow evening and do it again and thank Robert, you Adam. enjoy the rest of your evening you said okay um Sorry. there's one more question's come in but we, we can yeah, we can we answer can it. it tomorrow yeah okay we'll do it we, we can answer it tomorrow come back tomorrow, tomorrow whatever that question is yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night all. Adios.